while you're sitting there watching this video, you're basically swimming in a, a sea of air particles, different molecules like oxygen and nitrogen and some pollutants that came out of the exhaust pipe of somebody's car. And those are floating around you in the room right now. Some of those particles are sitting next to your head and some of them are even getting into what's called your ear canal. When you were young you learned what your ear was, that's the floppy flappy thing on the side of your head. That's not really your ear, that's something called your pinna which is a part of your ear. Most of your ear is actually inside your head. If you were to look in through the hole in the pinna, you're looking into what's called the ear canal and at the bottom of that is something called your eardrum or if you were a doctor, you'd call it the tympanic membrane. That eardrum can actually move in and out of your head, just like the head of a snare drum. That eardrum is pushed in and out by the molecules that are sitting next to it, the particles of air that are sitting in your ear canal next to your eardrum. And when that eardrum moves back and forth, a bunch of things happen inside your head, inside your inner ear, it's called, that wind up sending electrical signals to your brain. But all we'll really concentrate on for now is that movement of the eardrum, and we'll assume that if that moves, you can hear it. The way that moves is that it's pushed in and pulled out by the molecules that are sitting next to it. So let's pretend for a minute that you're in a one-dimensional world and that you have that eardrum, and next to that is just one molecule, one particle that sits next to your eardrum and can either push it into your head or pull it out. And that particle is pushed and pulled by the one next to it and the one next to it and the one next to it all in a line until you get all the way out to something that's moving in space. And that something, as it moves, pushes and pulls the air particles around that bump into each other and wind up causing a chain reaction that eventually pushes and pulls your eardrum in and out of your head, which causes a signal to go to your brain, which means you can hear the sound of a guitar or the sound of a bird chirping in the trees or a baby crying or a car driving by. Now, sometimes when you hear a sound, it sounds like a very low sound, a very low pitch, a low note on a piano, for example. And sometimes it sounds like a very high pitch, a very high note, like a flute or a piccolo or a bird chirping instead of a bass guitar or a diesel engine. When you're looking at a guitar string, it's going out and back and then back to where it started hundreds of times per second, maybe even thousands of times per second. So what we're talking about here is how frequently it vibrates each second or its frequency and that's act an actual number per second. Um, if you play a middle C on a piano then that string that's inside the piano is actually vibrating 261 point something times every second. So it'll do a full cycle out and back and back to where it started and repeat itself over and over and over 261 times per second. If you play one octave above that, so on a piano that's 12 notes or one scale, 12 semitones above, then that's two times the frequency. So you go from 261 cycles per second, we also say 261 hertz, up to 522 cycles per second. So that's 261 times two. That gives us one octave. Um, every time you go up one octave on the piano or on the guitar or if you're singing one octave higher, then the frequency at which the string is vibrating, the number of times per second it makes its out and in and back vibration, the number of times per second that happens is multiplied by two. So every time you go up by one octave, you double the frequency. In the same way, every time you go down by one octave, you half the frequency. So half of 261 will be 130 and a little bit. And half of that is going to be 65 and a little bit hertz, or 65 cycles per second. Of course, 
it doesn't have to be a guitar string or a bird chirping that's causing the sound to happen. It could be a loudspeaker. In fact, what we're doing when we do a recording is to put a microphone in front of a guitar, let's say. The string vibrates, that pushes and pulls the molecules, and those molecules then push and pull the diaphragm, the moving part of the microphone, and it gets either transmitted as electricity or stored somewhere, say on a hard drive or on a magnetic tape. We then take that signal and send it to a loudspeaker. And a loudspeaker is just a thing, a diaphragm, a, a disc, you could say, that moves in and out of a box, usually. And as it moves in and out, it pushes and pulls the molecules just like the guitar string did. And those molecules, again, bump into each other and push and pull your eardrum and you hear a sound. Again, we can change the frequency of the sound. What we do is we change how many times per second a loudspeaker driver, like a woofer, let's say, how many times it moves in and out of the box per second. So if it moves in and out of the box 261 times per second, then we'll hear a pitch coming out of the speaker that's the same as middle C on a piano. If we move it half as many times per second, then we'll hear an octave below. If we move it two times as many times per second, then we hear an octave above. When that happens, the molecules are being pushed and pulled by that loudspeaker or by the guitar string or whatever, and they move outwards into space. We can see that here in this animation that's happening. So the molecules move a little bit, and as they push and pull each other, you can see the compression wave moving outwards from the loudspeaker, and behind that is what's called the rarefaction wave, which is the molecules getting pulled apart. Compression means they're squeezed together. Rarefaction means they're moved apart. They move away from the speaker at some speed, which is the speed of sound. This isn't the speed that the molecules move at. This is the speed that the wave moves at, and that's different. If we could start sending sound out of a loudspeaker and then freeze the air, what we would see is that between the loudspeaker and your ear, there's some compression areas where the molecules are squeezed together and some rarefaction areas where the molecules are pulled apart. If you were to measure the distance between one compression and the next compression, what you have is the length of the wave in space, or what's called the wavelength. Let's say, for example, you're sending out a frequency, so you're moving that speaker 1,000 times per second. So it goes out and in and back again 1,000 times a second. And as you start doing that, that wave front starts moving away from the speaker, and it moves at a speed of 344 meters per second, give or take. Let's say after one second, you stop time. So now you freeze everything. What has happened now is that your speaker is about to make the 1,001th or 1,001st cycle. And that first cycle that it made is now 344 meters away. That means that you've got 1,000 waves of compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction, or squeezed together, pulled apart, squeezed together, pulled apart. There's 1,000 of those in the 344 meters distance to the loudspeaker. That means that every wave is 34.4 centimeters long. That's 344 meters divided by 1,000 waves. If we were to play an octave below that, so that's half of the frequency, that's 500 hertz, then you would have a wavelength that's twice as big because the speed of sound is the same. You're just putting fewer waves out per second, but they're moving away from you at the same speed. So you have the same distance traveled per second, but fewer waves per second to fill up that space. And every time you go down by one octave in frequency, then you're dividing the frequency by two, which means you're multiplying the wavelength by two. So every time you go down one octave, you have half as many cycles per second, half as many hertz, and twice as many meters per wave. Finally, we have to talk about how loud the sound is. This is just a measure of how much the pressure wave is varying. The bigger the change in pressure, the louder the sound. In order to increase the changes in air pressure, in order to make the sound louder, we have to increase the volume of air that we're pushing and pulling, the, the volume in liters. 
So if you think of a loudspeaker as a disc that's moving up and down or in and out, then the amount of air that it moves is a cylinder with the same diameter as the loudspeaker driver and a height that's the same as the amount the driver moves in millimeters, let's say. In order to make the sound louder, we have to increase the volume of air that we're moving. So we have to make that cylinder bigger. We can do that in one of two ways. We can either increase the height of the cylinder by moving the loudspeaker driver in and out further, or we can increase the diameter of the loudspeaker driver, say by buying a bigger woofer and moving it by the same number of millimeters. Either way, we'll be moving more liters of air and therefore making a louder sound.